our brethren have expounded to us very adequately over the past few days uh, the nature of the reign of our Lord. Uh, he's been placed in a position of power and dominion. That, uh, he, uh, he has been highly exalted, leaving nothing, un, nothing that has not been put under him. Uh, this morning, within this context, uh, I want to declare to you the purpose for which he has been given this dominion. I want to focus on the latter half of this verse that, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now before we go into the particulars of what to the church implies, I wanted for, to speak for a moment concerning the nature of our salvation and, and why it requires a reigning Savior for it, for it to be completed. I just want to give three Three primary reasons. Number one, because of the existence of the devil and, and the uh, principalities and powers which he commands. We need a reigning savior because of that. And because that you have a body that cleaves to the dust. And because of the environment of this present evil world. These are all factors that, that militate ag against this. That, that we need a reigning savior. The prison of sin, it can't be escaped from the person who's encapsulated in it. And the reason is because, firstly, you are, you're blind to the fact that you're even in prison. And secondly, there's a lock on your cell that you couldn't open even if you wanted to. And thirdly, there's, there's one at the door of your cell guarding it. In, in case you might have a moment of clarity who can, who can talk you down. So we need somebody who's more powerful than this one who's guarding our cell door. We need someone who can go in and who can tell us you're in prison and take that guard out of the way and unlock it for us and, and lead us out of the prison so, so that we might not wander back into it uh, unwarily. Uh, these, these are things that we don't have any power in and of ourselves to defend ourselves against. These, these principalities and powers, this wicked one. Uh, now... Uh, we have those in our day who, who have a penchant to, to say they want to bind the devil and we're going to rebuke the devil and all, all of these other things. And uh, um, I just want to uh, take us back to the, to the uh, um, beginning of human history. Let's, let's see an example of this. In, in the garden, when man had his first contact with the wicked one, the very first contact, the first conversation, so to speak, that they had with the devil, the devil had no problem in overcoming them. The devil is more powerful than we are in and of ourselves. This is the truth. That if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, if it wasn't for what he had done for you, if it wasn't that Jesus was highly exalted, you would have no power of, over the devil. And you didn't. You had no power over the devil. You were a slave to sin because Satan took you at his will and he took you into bondage. Now, without the involvement of God, men always default to sin. There's, there's no other option in this. I, I think that people have become numb to this fact in our day. They've, they've uh, um, underestimated the power of the devil because of the, of the success of Christ. But it's in Christ Jesus that that success is. And this, this is why we don't, we don't uh, encourage dialogue with the devil, so to speak. The only dialogue that we can have with the devil is no. That's about the only dialogue we want to have with him. Because at the point, even if you listen to what he says to you, he's deceptive. He has the power to deceive you. So why would you even listen to him? He, he'll get you to do what he wants you to do and you don't even realize that you did it. Because it's, it's not a clear black and white thing. He'll, he'll use scripture. He'll, he'll use some of the things that God said and he'll, he'll turn your mind to, to do his will. See, our adversary, the devil, he walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And if it wasn't for Christ, we would fall into that category of those whom he may devour. And this applies not only into our entrance, that, that Jesus is the one that had to overcome the devil to be able to pull us out, but this is in the going forward of the work, this is, this is the same. That he, he's been exalted to lead many sons to glory, and for that to happen, he has to be in an exalted place. We have to have a high priest that can be touched with our infirmities. We have to have an intercessor for our behalf, and to, to God for our behalf, and we need to have a satisfied God. And then that's why Jesus is there. To... Now with this in mind that, that Jesus has been highly exalted, that he, he has, has the power to, to save the, all those who um, come to him to the uttermost, uh, um, 
Why is it that Jesus hasn't been evidently set forth as being the head over all things? Why doesn't everybody know this? Well, the, the reason why God has allowed exalted Christ to be hidden and uh, allowed men to fight against him is because he has been exalted to be o the head over all things to the church. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a purpose that's being worked out here that has to be worked out. It has to be accomplished in an arena of conflict. Uh, God could not show his mercy unless there was a, a creature who needed mercy. Uh, he couldn't show his, his grace unless there was an opportunity to do so. So he, he allows these enemies ample opportunity to, to try and throw this dominion off of themselves. He, he gives the wicked one a space to work. Uh, he, he creates Adam and Eve perfect in innocence. But you ever think about, he left the serpent in the garden. And, and he allowed Eve to approach the tree. If this hadn't have been part of his will, then he, if he didn't want man to be, um, to be corrupted, then he could have just cast the, the serpent into another part of the earth. He, he, he could defeat Satan any time that he wanted to, but he allows him to continue. And uh, he allows the wicked one to attempt to frustrate his purpose because of his ultimate wisdom that he's getting more glory from uh, allowing him to continue than he would if he just stamped him out. Because he's actually, the, the wicked one is actually being fooled into doing the will of God. He, he's actually aiding in the perfecting of the saints. Uh, he's the one who, who moved the men to crucify Jesus. He, he had no idea what he was doing when he did that. That, that. that is what bruised him. That's what sealed his fate. So I, I just wanted to um, give an example of this. You know, Jesus, he allows uh, the wicked one to send a thorn in the flesh to our brother Paul. And this, he did this with the intent to distract him, to the uh, intent to, to make him despair and to cause others who looked at him to, to see him weak and unattractive. But this actually hurt the wicked one more than it helped him. Uh, through this, in, in the answer to Paul's prayer, he was able to see that my, God's grace is sufficient for me. And, and when I'm weak, I'm actually strong. This actually strengthened Paul. And, and again, concerning this, this thorn, th this revelation that Paul received was so great that if he hadn't had this thorn in the flesh, people who, people who saw him, they would have exalted him for the wrong reasons. They would have exalted him for, because of his speech and how... how you know. But this weeded out all the people who weren't serious, all the people who weren't sincere. They, they were only able to see Paul for what he really was, a, a, a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only those who were really interested in the things of God and those who appreciated what Paul was in the spirit, they were the ones that, that were inclined to to follow after him. Amen. Now, um, now we see Jesus working in this. His dominion that he has is actually exercised in a specific way. He exercises this dominion to arrange things in a way that the sons will be successfully led to glory. Uh, to, to, he, he arranges not only circumstance and the way that, that, that things go in the world, but he also rules in the hearts and minds of his followers. Uh, just like Brother Boy said earlier, that was good. That whenever you have an insight that comes unto you, where do you think that came from? That's excellent. Uh, some may balk at such a, such a suggestion, but how could it be any other way? Uh, how, could we, how could we have confidence that he would be able to take us all the way to glory if... If nothing was out of his control, if, he, if, if everything was, if it wasn't underneath God's control, how could we have that confidence that he could carry us all the way through? Amen. Now we have spoke thus far this renewal concerning the greatness and the dominion and power which Christ has been given. And uh, this is a dominion which is only one that is given to one who's worthy of it. Uh, we have established that, that Christ is worthy of this. Uh, and... Uh, specifically worthy of the purpose for which it was intended. I, I, I want to just briefly give a list of the reasons why Jesus is the appropriate choice for having been made head over all things to the church. It's kind of, um, I'd like for a moment to just kind of give his credentials for this divine office. Now, firstly, Jesus is the only one who's appropriate to be given this dominion because he, only he is the crucified one. He is the Christ, the chosen of God. He's the one who always does the things that please the Father. That's, that's why he wanted him to do this. He always does the thing that pleased the Father. 
He's, he's the only one who could do this, this work to bear the weight of sin and to, to be, as it were, the lightning rod of God's wrath. And, and he would be able to come back again because death couldn't hold him. Yes, amen. Death had no claim on him because he was perfect. He was innocent. He was the only one who would be able to, to offer up his blood as a propitiation for our sins. And he was the only one who could apply this blood in the way that it needed to be applied. And secondly, and this one might seem kind of odd to um, the casual onlooker, but there, there, there's some truth to this, that Jesus is a man. Uh, there are a few, a few things involved in this, that having been born into the world and being made flesh, he understands what he could have never understood just merely as the word. Uh, he, he, uh, it's just like Brother Tony was telling us. He knows what it's like to, to, to experience pain and thirst. And he knows what it's like to be persecuted and to have need. And these are all things that, that, that God did not have experience with. God never had any experience with these things. But he, he had to be able to have experience with this if he was going to be a faithful and a merciful high priest unto us. He gained a capacity that he didn't have before to, to be able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now, not, now that being said, not that he knows what it is like to sin. Rather, he knows what it's like to be in an environment where sin resides. He can sympathize with our frailty, and that's absolutely essential for, for the one who's going to be our high priest to be able to do that. I mean, could you imagine if God had put an angel in charge of this ministry? I mean, they have an unflinching countenance. And they, they, they don't have any mercy whenever it comes to the weakness of men. Uh, and, and, and Jesus, because of the fact that he's acquainted with this, he knows what we need when we need it. Amen. He knows when to chastise and, and when to comfort us. You know? He knows when to rebuke us and, and when, when to bless us. Uh, he, he's, he's not going to uh, quench that smoking flax. And also applied in his manhood is something that he could have never attained as the word is that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And I, I like what Brother Given said about this. He learned obedience so that he could teach it. Yeah, that's good. Who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. Though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation. Now this is what was required for him to be the author of this salvation that he would be perfect. Now, uh, not to imply that he and his essential nature was imperfect, but we're talking about the, the word here. This is the one who was in the beginning with God and, and was God, but in the role of a savior, there was something lacking in the divine character that had to be there in order for him to be perfect in his capacity as savior. Uh, he had to learn obedience. He had to learn compassion for men that surpassed a, a holy God beholding iniquitous beings. Now, have you not been comforted during this renewal, brethren, by the thought that we have an advocate on high who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, yet has no limits in the, in the area of authority? That he's been placed in this position so that all he is and all that he has accomplished can be ministered without hindrance. So if there's something he want, that he wants to give to you, he's been set up on high. He can, he can do it. There's nothing that's preventing him from doing it. Now, he rules over the circumstances in our lives, yet his rule is not only outward. It, it doesn't just concern the events of the times. He's ruling within the hearts and the minds of his people. Now, the scripture tells us that we can let the peace of God rule in our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, he, he exercises this dominion in giving us the divine nature. This is a nature that's, that's wholly reliant upon him for its sustenance. And this is, he supplies this. I want today to look at him not only as being the federal head of all things, as the one who sets up kings and the one who puts them down, but also to see that he is the captain of our salvation and he is the head of the body. Is the means by which the individual members find nourishment and actually know the direction in which they're, they're, they're moving. Now, the church. Now, these are two words that alone evoke a great deal of contemplation. 
Uh, this is really the purpose of God as it concerns humanity expressed in summary, the church. Uh, that he'll have a body of people who are wholly united in one purpose and one nature and who are wholly conformed unto the image of his son. That he'll actually have these people as a habitation of himself in the ages to come. Uh, that these people will be suitable for him to be able to display his, his kindness and his grace. Uh, this, this is like a summary of the project. Let's see then how Jesus is arranging these things that, that they might come to pass. And he gave some apostles and he gave some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. As soon as he is exalted, we see him working in this. He goes about setting things in order, so to speak. He sets up the individual members in the office that, uh, that's appropriate to what he's doing. He gave uh, some men unto us who were like the foundations of the faith. He, he gave them revelations that were unparalleled, and, and he, through them he actually crafted the word by which we know Jesus. Uh, that's, that's a profound thought that, that, that these men are, are, we wouldn't know anything about Christ if it wasn't for these men. If it wasn't for the work that Jesus had done in them to be able to, to put down this record and to give us a testimony of Christ, to, to deliver unto us the gospel. See, God determined that by the foolishness of preaching, that, that, that's how we should save them that believe. So in the present time, this is, this is, we can see this in what he's doing. He, he raises up preachers who are, who are able to divide the word rightly and who are, able, who are skilled in speaking. And, and then he gives those who are skilled in speaking to those who are without, who are excellent in delivering the gospel to, to those who would be saved, our, our evangelists. And then again, he, he gives us... Uh, every one of us grace to minister to the saints and other things we have some that specialize in help some who are who are excellent in giving mercy and all of these various aspects of the divine nature in his infinite wisdom god through christ arranges these members into a whole and we're woven together like the threads of a tapestry and brethren we have seen this in our very midst this week uh, we've seen the brethren in these last few days uh, um, we, in this, we've actually seen Jesus building his church. We've actually been able to behold this before our very eyes. Uh, each, each member was given a blessed but a different perspective of things. Uh, and in this, there's no contradiction. There's no schism. It's, they're different, but yet they testify of the same thing. According to the flesh, this couldn't happen. I mean, we have a, a lot of people here who we have a very large age range. We have some people who are from all the way across the country that the only way that we know them is, is through Christ. In, in the world, to unite this body of people, it would be a difficult thing. They'd have to come up with some kind of plan and program to find the common denominator between all of us. And even then, there'd have to be some kind of a compromise for us to be, be able to come together. We wanted to be, be able to provide a time where we can all get up here and speak because we'd be afraid that, that that would destroy the division or the, just destroy the union. But why is it that all, every one of us, we live so far away from each other and we were pre-delivered topics and yet we can prepare these things while we're not together and come here and it's like we spoke with one voice. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, see this is where we're going, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, this, is, this is the direction in which things are moving, and we can see God working in our midst concerning this. And we have all received of his fullness and grace for grace. So we, we all have something that one another needs. Has this just happened? No, absolutely not. Jesus, by his administration, he has seen fit to, to put something in each and every one of us that we all need. And he draws our hearts and our minds to consider certain aspects of his word. And he, he gives us individual insight. And this is what all, all works it together as we come together. So I, I wanted to say something about the fullness because... Uh, um, as I said, we've all received of his fullness, but there's a difference between receiving of his fullness and being measured up to the stature of his fullness. See, the image of Christ is of such a nature, it's so large that it can't be deposited in just one person. It can't even be deposited in all those who believe in Christ in our present generation. This is something that only the body of Christ can have. 
that in aggregate, as we stand before him on that day as his spotless bride, we will be a perfect reflection of him then. And we will have grown up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, just to highlight this further, I wanted to share what we spoke about in our last men's meeting because it was so good. The, the manner of this joining together, the way in which the Lord orchestrates it, it's by joints and bands. It's, it's by the, the, together, the working of every part. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. See, he, he's the one through Jesus Christ that's administering this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. Now we had this, this uh, brought out in our last men's meeting. It was a fresh perspective that we notice here that uh, the, the supply comes from the joint. It comes not from the individual members, but from when they come together, when that joint comes together, that's where it's supplied. Amen. The, the individual parts, they have their own thing, but when it comes together in a joint... That's when, that's when something happens. That's the manner of, of, of the working of Christ in the church. Now, I wondered if I should include this in here because I, I shared it with the brethren on, on Sunday already, but not all you were there, and it was, it was good, so I want to say it again. But the, the reason why all these things about the exaltation of Christ that we have heard, that we've been given to see in the past few days are such a blessing to us is because in the new covenant, God hasn't just come down unto us. You know, the, um, Brother Given always give this example about Lambert, you know, the, the, the home of the throw rolls. It's not, he's not just throwing blessings at you in Christ Jesus. He has raised you up to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has been exalted, but you've been exalted there with him too in the spirit. Uh, this is a place, he brings us up there to be with him. Now, this is the place that we can fellowship with the spirits of just men made perfect in heaven. It's there that the cares of this earth melt away and we, we can set our affection on things above when we're up there. We don't have to look at the things above from down here. We can go up there and we can taste of them. We can touch them and handle them. We can taste of the heavenly gift and uh, we can uh, feed and increase our appetite for these things. And, and incidentally, that up there, the flesh can't survive up there. The altitude is so high, there's like no air for them to breathe. That's, we starve our flesh when we go up there. That's a good place. As we met together this week, this is what we've been doing. As, as we have seen that Jesus is exalted, we have all been exalted up into the heavenlies with him. We've all overcome tiredness and the infirmities of our flesh this week. So the, the, the former things haven't come to mind as we have been thinking about these things. All, we've all come to the feast that God has prepared in the midst of our enemies. We have enemies within and enemies without, even, even as we sit here in this very room. But we were able to overcome that. Why is that? Because Jesus is the head of all things to the church. Amen. This is the working of the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. Southern brethren, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how, she, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Amen. Thank you, brother.